Horn Hangout World. It's great to see you all again. Good afternoon from Berlin. Good evening from Tim in Melbourne. And good morning, Denise and Dave in the States. Hi, you guys. Good morning. It's great to see you. I'm sure you all know exactly who I've got here on the chat. Denise Tryon, Fourth Horn Philadelphia, and Dave Griffin, Fourth Horn Chicago Symphony Orchestra. It's so fantastic to see you guys this morning. Uh, it's great to be here. Denise, how, how, what time is it? Nine o'clock? Nine o'clock. And Dave? Uh, it's eight in the morning here in Chicago. It was supposed Ooh. to be a nice sunny day, and uh, the picture would look really great in my sunroom, but instead it's a kind of cool, rainy day here. Hmm, sorry about that. Um, is eight o'clock in the morning a painful time for you? On a weekday, no, because uh, the kids get up for school. Um, so I've made my daughter's lunch and helped her get out the door and all is well. Okay, great. Um, I think ladies first. So I'm going to introduce the, the Horn Hangout world to Denise, although most of them know her already. Denise, what have you done this morning? Uh, this morning I I got up, I ate breakfast, and I warmed up so just in case we're doing anything fun and exciting. Okay, that's cheating because I didn't warm up. I've had the morning off. Dave, did you warm up already? Well, if you count five minutes of noodling on my horn warming up, then that, a little bit. That counts. That okay. counts. <laughs> Denise, you're in your studio in Philadelphia. I am. Yeah, I have this great room in my house that is dedicated just, just to be my studio so I can teach and practice whenever I want. You've got some quite special things in your studio that you showed me when we were doing a test the other week. I do. What happened to the Strauss memoir? Can you show me that? So the, uh, the, the thing on my wall, is that what you're asking? Also, also I was the, the, the thing that sort of does this and it's... And, oh, and yes, like right. That. So uh, <laughs> there was a, it's a small story that goes along with this before I show it. Uh, I teach at Peabody Conservatory and I tend to, when I go there, I tend to teach very long hours. So I was teaching a class at the very end. It was about 11 hours of teaching that day. So I was a little bit tired, which usually means I'm a little bit silly. And uh, there was a little drawing on a chalkboard of uh, a little donkey or a little dog, a horse, something. It was hard to tell. And we were working on a particular excerpt, and uh, not what I'm getting ready to reference, but we were working on something. And, uh, and I was saying that the the rhythm and everything that we were working on should be you know similar to Don Quixote and then I just happened to look over at this chalkboard and I said you know like Don Quixote and the class went crazy for that so uh, so that at the next horn party they got a pinata uh, I wasn't able to go to the horn party they got a pinata that was a donkey and they named him Don Quixote and uh, as a souvenir <clears throat> after they uh, got the goods out of the pinata, they gave me its head. Wow. So I have I have Don Quixote's head in my studio. So that's to inspire your students. You also have something hanging on the wall to inspire your students that you should yes, be so forgive as I start to move the camera here. Okay. <clears throat> I really it. believe I'm sorry? It's worth it. Yes. So let's see if I can do this well. Okay, a cobrage a day <clears throat> keeps the stink, oh come on, keeps, keeps the, the stink, stink away. away. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, are you a coprash uh, practicer? Uh, I, I do a few of those etudes. It's been a while since I pulled them out, but maybe hey, I should. Yeah. You better keep that stink yeah. away. Yes. <laughs> Denise, um, Alf has just written on the chat saying you ate bacon. <laughs> I love bacon. And yeah. everyone who knows me knows that I love bacon. So yes, I ate bacon this morning. Okay. And who is Alf? Uh, <laughs> Alf is uh, a student of mine. <laughs> he knows that you eat bacon every morning. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So, Denise, Denise, your fourth horn in Philadelphia. Do you have a, a, a? Do you play second as well, or are you are you literally is, is fourth horn your official job, or how does that work? Well, fourth horn is my official job, uh, but I am always available to play second if we need some rotation. If somebody goes down sick, uh, if somebody needs a, a week off. So I, I play second a, a few times a year. 
Um, but mostly I, I play fourth. Okay, Dave, how about you? How does that work in Chicago? It sounds very similar to what Denise just, just described. Um, our second horn player loves to play everything, so even though I, I might do. be able to, to uh, you know, play an occasional concerto or overture or Mozart symphony, he likes to be on stage and play rather than sitting backstage. So um, mostly I play fourth unless Jim has a, an entire week off. But Dave, so, I saw a photo last week of you playing second horn with the most amazing conductor. Last oh, week. yes. Your brother, Alistair, he was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, we had a great week with him. Uh, for those who don't know, Sarah's brother, Alistair Willis, is uh, a uh, he's music director of the Springfield, uh, Illinois Symphony, and he's a, one of our regular uh, guest conductors with the Chicago Symphony, and a super nice guy, too. Oh, thanks. Same, I didn't pay He has Dave. the same smile. <laughs> has the same smile. Oh, yeah. oh. No, he was conducting there last week, and I saw a picture of you of him on stage, and you were playing second. So that's how I knew that. <laughs> um, you guys wouldn't believe it. The um, the questions are coming in fast. We we have people watching from Macedonia, Las Vegas, Mexico, Russia, Sweden, um, all over the states. I mean, it's really quite quite incredible. Dave, where are you right now? Uh, I'm at my home. Uh, in the back of the house, we have a room called the sunroom, and if it were a nice, bright, sunny day, like I was hoping it would be, it would yeah. be a great room for this uh, uh, video chat. Uh, my studio is down in the basement, but the, the Wi-Fi connection is not so good there. Um, you guys are lucky to have studios. In Berlin, we all live in apartments, and, and, and recently, the, the people, I live on the fifth floor, and my neighbors on the first floor said, um, I've been living there for, over, for, for years and years and years, and I really didn't think they could hear that far, and my neighbors on the first floor said the other day, oh, we like that blues piece you were practicing the other day, and I was doing some bending exercises, but uh, <laughs> I was horrified that they could hear me practice, so we basically practice here in the Philharmonie. <laughs> um, Listen, should we get to some of these questions? Because, I mean, the, the question, I'm sure you two have been asked more than any, anything else, and this is what I get always when I do master class, people say to me, um, why did you become a low horn player? And I, I find this question, I mean, I, I giggle when I hear that, because did either of you plan to be, become a low horn player? Denise, did you plan? No, definitely not. I was a high horn player for forever, and, uh, and I had a good low range, and I loved playing low. Uh, but then the first job I won was fourth in Columbus, and that's that's how it started. And I just stayed from there. Right. I, I would uh, caution anyone, uh, especially students, trying to specialize in either low or high because you just don't know uh, where your job opportunity is going to come up. In, in a symphony orchestra, you're like CSO. Fort Horn plays lots of high notes, too, uh, with all the repertoire that we go through. Um, so I, I can't say that I just, you know, that would be um, well, neither not so helpful. Say that. Dave, your CD certainly shows that you do not specialize in the low range. I was looking everywhere at home. I have it, but in my chaos, I didn't. I was going to show it in the, in the camera and say that everyone has to go out and buy it, because it really is great. We can't, we can't specialize in the low range, can we? We have to have those high notes. Yeah, it's true. To be a professional musician, you have to be able to play all over. The, a high horn player, you have to be able to play low, so you need to be able to do everything. How does it work in the States? How, do you have students specializing in this? Um, do you teach? Um, Dave, do you have students that just specialize in low horn from a young age, or do you, or do you encourage them to be able to do everything until the first job comes up? Right. Some of them get to college and they think, well, there's no way I'll ever uh, be a high horn player, so all I'm going to do is low play. And I uh, really advise against that. So I would try to steer them towards some repertoire that would uh, really pique their interest and just give them a chance to play more high. It's really a matter of either having the opportunity or finding the opportunity to play uh, some different things outside of your comfort zone that will, um, you know, help build you more completely. Yeah, yeah, no. Denise, add in there. I mean, I feel like a little bit like a talk show host today um, <laughs> because this is the first time, you guys, that we've had two guests in two different places. I mean, it's really very exciting to be able to do this. It's just a little bit difficult to manage with Google Hangout because if we all speak once, then all you'll see is, hey, try it, you guys. Let's all just talk at once and see what Google picture.
Okay. I have no idea what that caused, but that's what will happen. So we'll behave ourselves and be at least we'll behave ourselves for a while. <laughs> um, so did you then start changing everything around? Was it something you could do right from the beginning? It was something I did in the beginning. Uh, and I've always had a good low register, uh, which was great. Um, sometimes in college, when I wanted to be playing a little bit more first, I was kicking myself that I had a good range because I wanted to be doing more than just playing some low parts. But eventually that, that came around. Uh, so when, uh, when I got the job, Columbus, I just kept doing what I had been doing and maybe did a little bit more practicing, but not by much. I, um, I, second horn in the, in the Staatsoper, and I hadn't planned on, planned on being a low horn either, uh, although I'm very, very proud to be one now, and I even wore my low horn earrings for you. See that? Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, they're low because they're facing around the wrong way. That's why. <laughs> um, but when I got the, the, the job I officially got here when I joined was fourth horn. Now we have a rotation system, which is great because it you know keeps us fit um, easier. It's better than practicing. Playing a Mozart symphony is better than practicing. So <laughs> that's how we stay fit. Um, but to the fourth horn audition, to win that audition, I really went into low horn bodybuilding training, like literally playing a lot of loud stuff in the low range, a lot of um, a lot of blast play, and then doing a lot of really quiet slurs, but everything like really low, a lot of tuba exercises and studies. Tubas have some great studies out there. Um, Dave, when, what was your first job? Uh, my first job was second horn in the Rochester, New York Philharmonic. Okay. So we all, uh, yeah, we all started off actually on a lower position. Mm -hmm. And to win the job in Chicago, did you have to, did you sort of turn well, it down a few notches? Uh, after, after Rochester, I had two first store jobs, associate principal in Montreal and associate That's principal right. I'm in sorry, Houston. I do apologize. I did Google you, know, you. I did read that. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was a little bit of a trick preparing uh, the low horn uh, things up to real but uh, I just find having a good low range is just part of being a complete horn player. Can't turn one off and and uh, all of a sudden have you know a better opposite range. It's it's but just you came you came from leading a section to being the fundament of the section. So did you do? People want people are asking. They want to know um, what sort of exercises did we do for that? Okay, um, I do exercises and drills. I think they're important and they're helpful, but. I think it's way more important to find some really compelling music that you're interested in. I love the Bach cello suites, um, in low range book, uh, just just finding beautiful melodies and playing them down this register. So if you, I, I really believe if you have a, a song in your head, then this your embouchure will figure out how to achieve that. So Yay! yes, I, I do the exercises and drills, and they're helpful, but they get tedious after a while. I'd rather spend time uh, playing some beautiful melodies down the low range. You know what happened recently? I was at my, my best friend's flute player and I was visiting her and her daughter and I didn't bring any music with me. I asked her if she had any flute books and I thought I'd transpose them. So she gave me a beginner's book for flute players and they were all opera melodies. And I just thought that's a flute players and horn players for beginners, the flute players start with opera melodies and horn players start with ba, 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 you know? So if we all played more melodies at the beginning, I think it might might do exactly what you say, Dave. It might get us away from all this, put your left tooth here, put your wisdom tooth there, and this lip down. It might get us away from that because if you're playing the melody and you're playing it beautifully, it is working right as well. Amen. Well, we can go. We can all go off and have coffee. Actually, enough. That's all there is. <laughs> Listen, we've had some interesting things on the chat. Paul has said, "Dear all, um, I'm curious in what your careers has allowed you to focus on low horn." I've answered that, um, but I wanted to read you this thing because he's just won second horn with the Illinois Alastair. Yay, Paul! That's great. That's great. And Dean Foley. And I studied with in London. He's asked a great question. He wants to know. I'll let you guys answer this. Um, he wants some tips on playing fast and loud in the low range. Denise. Oh, 
I just started <laughs> with you on that one. Because <laughs> <clears throat> you have the best hair. Yeah, well, you know. Uh, I'd get up extra early to work on that. Uh, okay. I would say... How long, sorry? Does that, how long does that take? <laughs> uh, it depends how tired I am this morning it took me a little bit longer but you know really only about five to ten minutes not long cool not Dave long I mean yeah uh, yeah I won't ask you how long it you took you this morning <laughs> anyway, back, back to low horn <laughs> yeah so loud uh, loud are we talking articulation or slurs yeah. or so fast and loud in the low range let me see what does he say uh, oh I've lost him he's gone there's so much so many messages um, what did he say? Uh, fast and loud in the extreme register. I think he means just generally. So, um, yeah, both. Yeah. Uh, well, I think starting off with some loud long tones just so you can start to feel how the air works and how everything can be supported. And then I would just start with some nice chromatic work, go and then again feeling how the air works and then add the tongue into that if it's a tonguing path. Uh, but I, I think the the more you focus on how you're using your air, the better everything will be in the end. Yeah. Any tips of any more, anything else to add to that, Dave? Uh, practice opposites, too. If, if you have a articulated passage to the low range, do it all legato and maybe transpose it down a step or uh, you know, a couple steps uh, so that when you go back to the original key, uh, it will feel relatively easy. Uh, I, I just think it can set in very quickly if you do the same thing over and over again. So find ways to uh, practice the same passage just a little bit differently. Um, that's really helpful for me. Yeah. Paolo has just joined the chat. Paolo Munoz Toledo. Hola, Paulito. He's in Switzerland. He's in um, and I asked him to join the chat because he's answering the questions in Spanish. So thank you very much. Fergus is on the chat as well. So good morning to Fergus. I tell you, this is great. There's everyone out there. Um, um, hi, Fergus. Thank you for everything you're answering. Um, Ollie from England has asked, how do we keep up our high ranges? And that, that's a good question. It's a bit, for me, it's a little bit of a, of a struggle to have discipline um, to keep practicing. I play in the Berlin Phil Brass Ensemble, and you know what that's like. I'm the only horn in a 12-priest bass ensemble. The guys say I'm only there for decoration because no one can hear me anyway. Um, but uh, thanks, guys. Um, but to coming up it means really like hours of of high horn practice of doing boop, 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 boop. There's, there's no getting around it but I get bored doing that so I play the Brandenburg concerto slowly and quite loudly and that's a bit more fun than doing exercises um, but for me it's it's that you have to spend a lot of time doing that sadly <laughs> Denise yeah, I, I make sure that I practice because uh, if I don't practice high every day I as much of it obviously in my job as I do in the low register so I need to practice that every day so I just be sure that I do some etudes or something up in that register um, loud and soft because everyone has something that they're better at so if your forte is playing forte then play some soft stuff so that you're covering the basis of your horn playing every day yeah I absolutely agree with that practice what you can't do because yeah. it's great for the for the for the self confidence. Every day we should play something we can play. But what's the point in practicing the same thing every day if if you can do it, you know? And right. if, if you have a horn concert coming up, then you know there's no way around it. Dave, how do you cope with that? Just find things that are are fun and interesting to play. Like pick out a few of the really uh, soft passages of the Brahms Horn Trio in the third movement and play those over and over. Uh, yeah. All the Mozart concerti have some great uh, scales that go up into the high register. Uh, do those several times and maybe transpose them too. Um, yeah. You know, peak your your musical mind, and uh, it will really help your your embouchure develop. Dave, um, I'm I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name. Sorry, Trajanos Trajanos Scherlund. Know your name. You're on the horn hangouts a lot, but I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. But he asks you, Dave, what kind of horn do you play on? Uh, I have a Steve Lewis horn uh, made here in Chicago, and the bell flare is an Alexander bell flare from a uh, a desk Alexander desk I have at home. One day I just tried the Alexander bell flare on my Lewis, and I liked it even better. 
<laughs> Denise, what kind of horn do you play? We're getting really nerdy here. I love it. Yeah, I, I play a rauk. I have two rauks. I've had one for about 15 years and the other one for close to 10. Uh, and I am so not an equipment geek. I don't try anything out. If I find something I like, I play with it. That comes to my next question. Kendall Gray, also a huge horn hangout um, supporter. Hi, Kendall. He said, I think he's in Chicago, right? Yeah, so he's just down the road from me, Dave. Um, how, if at all, did your equipment change when your job became a low horn emphasis? Uh, I can agree with Denise. I'm the same. I'm so absolutely not a mouth a geek at all in that respect. Geek in the in the respect that I love horn and I love low horn. But um, as it comes to equipment, I've been playing on the mouthpiece for... I think over 20 years, um, uh, and didn't even change it when I changed down to low horn. It's Fergus McWilliam one with a Paxman four. If it works, don't change it. Um, did you have to change anything, Denise, when you started emphasizing? Uh, <clears throat> I've only played in in my lifetime. I've only played three mouthpieces, and when I got the job in Columbus, I was playing a Holton Farkas medium cup, just about as down the middle of the road as you can get. And uh, through my time in Columbus, I started, uh, the principal horn there was uh, working on uh, the prototype for his mouthpiece, and so he would have me try those out, and I really fell in love with it. So that's what I play now. I'll get it now for a second. Hey, mouthpiece so, talk. Yay. Yeah, so I have, this is a Gene Stanley look that comes from Hauser, and it's got a black rim. I'm, I think everyone can see that. Uh, and. The mouthpiece itself is made out of stainless steel, so for anyone who has allergy issues, you know, if you have really severe, I don't. I just like the feel of it. So the rim is uh, Julie Lamb, um, 1875, and then I play with the weight. Yeah, well, the that thing. I'm so, un I so, so know nothing. You guys, Fergus is on the chat, so if you have any specific mouthpiece questions, ask Fergus, because he's designed a great range. Ask <laughs> Fergus on the chat, but can you just tell me what that is there? Maybe yeah, I so need this... This weight uh, goes on the, the shank of the mouthpiece, and uh, Dan Dan Rauch made it for me. So it goes goes on the shank of the mouthpiece, and it sort of helps for me solidify articulation, it sort of deaden some of the higher pitches that I was getting on the horn on the mouthpiece, and I mean I mean overtones. So for me, it really made my sound nice and rich. For some people, it makes their sound too dead. But for me, it also just really solidifies articulation. So Dave, I love it. Dave, she's saying she's not a mouthpiece. I her. swear I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. Yeah, right. You've got a heavy weight. You've got a black rim. You've got this and that. You had something built for you. Yeah, right. Yeah, but it, not, look how cool it is. Look how it's cool, really cool. That looks. I, so the black doesn't come from eating too much bacon in the mornings. <laughs> I swear it doesn't. <laughs> Okay. All right, Dave, your turn to be a mouthpiece nerd. Uh, I changed to a Scott Lasky 725G uh, shortly after I joined the orchestra, and it's really the first piece that I played that the it actually is it feels great. There's such a nice cushion to the rim. Show it to us. Yeah. yeah. And you guys, I've got to take a screenshot of this. Everyone, show me their mouthpieces. Great, thank you. So that's Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Tell um, us. The reason why I changed it I felt like the legato was even better. Uh, the slur's more voluptuous, um, sounding, and at the same time, it, it really it almost feels like your lips are getting a massage because of the way the the rim. I just love it. Um, now, in terms of equipment, no one asked me to change equipment. I already had a Lewis horn when I joined the Chicago Symphony. But one uh, kind of funny story is, really after I joined the orchestra, Dale, as he was coming on stage, would kind of sneak up behind me, and he would take my hand and just open it. Just to so that's kind of an equipment change. Okay, uh, that's something. That's something. I want to is this hand position? But um, I just that that's exactly what uh, Ken Pope is watching. You guys know Ken. Um, Ken Pope, hi, nice to see you. Um, and he said, did any of changes when we started our jobs, the big jobs? I didn't, I had to, lit I had, but I had to open But if you can count the hand as equipment. I stayed on the same mouthpiece and the same horn. Um, and Dave, you said 
had to open your hand a little bit. Any other equipment changes that went on? No. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Denise? Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, in Philadelphia, we play quite a mix of horns, and traditionally, 15, 20 years ago, they all played con, con ADs, uh, and that has slowly been cha changing as different people come in. Uh, our principal horn, she, she plays a con and a rauk, so she plays a fourth. Uh, our second horn only plays a con, and, and we have other people who have multiple horns and will bring certain instruments in to get a different sound. Not been asked to change, um, and I only I only play my rauk. Uh, they do. It's a, it's a slightly darker sound here than what I typically play. So um, when I'm playing by myself, be that Beethoven nine or a recital or something like that, I play with a quite an open hand. But then in the orchestra, I have to play with a slightly more covered hand. Okay, um, Celia from Melbourne. Hi, Celia. I know her. I she got something here, Celia, to show everyone that you, that you gave me. I'll show you guys in a minute. It said, could you repeat Dave's mouthpiece type? Now, I'm, I paid so much attention that I forgot what it was. Dave? Scott Lasky, L-A-S-K-E-Y, 725G. And the story about that is Scott kind of came out with this new mouthpiece, and he took me aside. You know that G stands for Griffin. And then I also heard that he with our uh, associate principal horn player, Dan Gingrich, and he said, well, you know that 725G, the G stands for Gingrich. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. But listen, I want to show you what, C uh, Celia is an amateur horn player in Melbourne who I met last time I was there. You guys know this as well as I do. Low horn used to be the thing that the high, the people who couldn't get the high notes had to do. Low horn never had really any culture. And that's why I adore you two so much, because, you know, you're out there making it into a true, a true culture, and Celia made me this, oh. <laughs> because it was very cold in in Melbourne when I was there. I you, Let's get Sarah, Sarah, I bet you'd look good in that. Thank you. It's a water bottle cover. Thank you. Where where was I supposed to wear it on my head? <laughs> let, let's not. Maybe your let's iPad not. could fit in it. That's actually that's I'd get it get more use. The, um, I just want to talk about the hand. Okay, hand position, and everyone who's watching who's not horn player, I guys, but this is really what we do. We love to talk about this sort of stuff. Um, the hand position is a really important thing for me because uh, when when I started playing horn in Germany, um, the Germans play much open anyway, play like that because it hurts my thumb. But he was the first person I heard on low horn use it, use the hand as much as possible. Um, to the lower you go, but you guys. Are Americans, and um, I was just wondering whether you use the same sort of hand technique, or because you play on your leg a lot of the time, players play more not muffled but darker over there. Denise, uh, well, it depends on where in the country you are. There are some areas of the country that play exclusively on the leg and with a much more covered sound, and there are areas of the never play on the leg and play with a very open sound. Uh, I personally don't like to play on the leg, uh, mostly because I find it, it stops me being able to facilitate the horn. I need to do a little bit of pivoting as I move through the registers. But I, I like an open hand position. Uh, and in fact, since we're doing this, yeah, we're so, being, we're oh, be, I'll oh. take my candy out of my bell. I'm glad. It, what was that? What was it? That was my chamois. All right, okay. <laughs> so I like to play with my thumb actually on top of my finger. It's hard to, so it's hard. Yeah. Can I just interrupt you just for one second? Gail yeah. Williams is watching. Hi, Gail. Hi, Gail. <laughs> and she just so, said that that, that that position, we'll get back. Morning, Gail. So Thanks. I, for I put my thumb, yeah, sort of, yeah, and then I like, dry, yeah. So it's quite pointed, yeah. Like that. So, all the way on the side, but quite open. That's hard to see. Yeah, <laughs> and sometimes I actually play with my hand straight in the middle of the horn. Okay. So that there's sound coming out on either side. Like, especially if we're playing Sibelia 6 and 7 with your boss right now, with Simon. I know he's my love. <laughs> yes, and he sends his love right back. Uh, so, and there are a ton of 
pedal G's in that, so I'm playing right down the middle of the bell for that so that I'm getting a little bit more sound. Yeah. So, uh, Dave, Dale, your hands secretly, and um, how do you guys do that there? I think very similar to what uh, Denise has described. Uh, sometimes an extreme low register really open up uh, quite a bit, but it's it's a rare like maybe those low pedal concert A's in the Shostakovich fifth, they seem to pop out a little bit more uh, when my hand is really open. The problem with, uh, you know, information can suffer if, if your hand is totally pulled out. So I, instead of just pulling it out pretty far in and then just, you know, open the door as far as possible. So I think it's really important. I think the hand is a much neglected piece of equipment depending on what's going on next to you. And uh, at least I think you do. And on the pieces you're playing, horn players, um, I think it's really something that everyone can experiment with. Um, and deal sound. I'm not saying that one hand position is right and the other one is wrong. Of course not. We're not saying that. But that's why we have three different people here with all the three different um, experiences. But um, you know, everyone has to experiment with what what they like best or what their horn section like best. Um, Gail has actually written a question that leads me on to my next question. Um, Gail asked if we have any favorite solo works for low horn apart from the Bagatella. Now Fergus immediately wrote, I hate the Bagatella and Paolo's Ada, although I've heard him play it a million times. Dave, do you have any favorite solo works? Uh, for low horn. It's uh, a tough one. There's not a lot out there. Yeah. Let me think about yes. that. Okay, you can think about that because Denise is now going to tell us about her project Yes, uh, so I'm in the middle of a project of commissioning uh, works for low horn. Right now I've got, yay, mostly with piano, although I am in talks with someone, and since it's um, finalized, I can't really say who it is, but I am in talks with someone about an unaccompanied piece for low horn. But right now I've already had one piece written for me that I'll be promoting this summer at a couple of uh, events that I'll be at by uh, Brett Miller, and it's a piece for horn and piano, it's about six minutes long. And uh, I've got two coming in, one by Andrea Clearfield, which will be about a 10 minute long piece, and another by uh, Paulek, who is a member of the Quadra Horn Quartet. So I'm also looking, you know, I'm in talks with other people, I'm hoping for five to seven new pieces over the next two to three years. So. That's fantastic because the boredom does set in if the only thing you have is the noise. I discovered a, 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 a low horn concerto by Rossetti. Well, I didn't find it and sent it to me. And when we did the double horn concerto CDs with Klaus Wallendorf, um, I got the low horn concerto on one of those. I didn't even know it existed. And I tell you something, it's not something I want to play in public. <laughs> it's, really, it's really hideously difficult. Um, I've got um, a, a low horn piece coming out. Richard Bissell has written me a piece. and sent it and I said, oh Richard, you know, we've got to make it a little bit more, more, you know, more exciting and more, more impressive. And he said the second version and I am really struggling with it. Every time I go to the horn room, all they're hear the, hearing is low horn acrobatics. Um, so I'm hoping that. Um, Dave, any thoughts? Well, in, in recitals I've done, let's say, three movements for Bach cello suite. One doesn't have to play the whole entire suite. Uh, you know, three movements of it you'll, you'll certainly have a lot of great low horn moments and um, you know they they work very nice in, in the middle of a recital too it's the sort of thing where it's length uh, it doesn't really fatigue you in terms of your overall endurance this is before I ask you about the recitals Bob Lover 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 from Pittsburgh says hey Dave and Denise he's watching I asked him if he was got up early in the morning he should join in so it's great to you or hear you Thanks for joining us. Um, so uh, this recital thing, you two both stand up there and do recitals. If you're playing, I find, if I'm only playing low horn, only playing low horn, in quotation marks, um, you sort of forget to hear that much because you're concentrating on the person next to you, which means whenever you have a solo, um, like one note, one note can be harder for me than the end of Held and Laban on first horn. Because the whole evening listen to your sound and be getting used to playing solo and then you have one note like the Berlioz Symphony Fantastique. Ah, Dave, like your 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 section's global horn greeting long notes. That was so cool. That's great. <laughs> but don't you find that these these orchestra can be totally stressful because we don't have too much to play beforehand? Yeah, it's 
Someone once described it as uh, having one very precious egg in your basket. And whatever you do, don't drop that egg. <laughs> it's hard when you when you're fourth horn. You have one solo every three months, so uh, you tend to. I say, love that oh, analogy. I love it. Got a solo coming up, and then as you get closer and closer to it, like here's my one solo, and so it, it we tend to blow it way out of uh, importance. Uh, what I Lately, uh, generally we get four weeks off in the end of August and September, and I'll do a recital in the middle of September. It keeps me practicing. When I started the season, I'm starting on a high note. Um, you know, I, I'm in shape, recital, and then I can do it. But Dave, that's amazing, doesn't it? Terrify the pants off. You? Uh, I actually look forward to it. It's it's fun for me. Well, that, the, that's amazing. That's just, I, I have to say though, the one hour before the recital, I'm. Why am I doing this? <laughs> but then, when things get going, it's okay. How about you? You do a lot of recitals too. I do. Uh, I, I took about years off of doing recitals. So after I got my uh, undergraduate degree, I was like, thank, thank goodness, I don't have to do any more recitals. And then, as time went along, I okay. Wait a minute. I'm getting too. Uh, not used to hearing my own sound, you know. It's like when you then you get that one note, and you're like, "Wait, that's what I really sound like over the orchestra." So maybe I should do something to try and get out of this cycle. So I gave, yeah, I gave my first recital in 15 years, about five years ago, and I tried to give uh, two or three. Sometimes they're half recitals, sometimes they're full recitals throughout the year, and uh, it's yeah, about the hour, maybe two hours before I'm. Why? Why did I choose to do this? What am I doing? Why did I pick that piece? But it's it, I always find that I'm a much better player afterwards than I was before. So that's why I continue to do it. Total awe of you both because I haven't done a recital in years because basically I'm terrified of doing them. But uh, as you said the other day, Denise, I could start doing them in a nursing home or some yeah. somewhere to just sort of build it back up again. It, it's not that, that um, I don't believe I can play the horn, it's that I'm scared of getting back up there and playing alone with piano. It reminds me of my traumatic student days, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all those terrible up there and play in front of all your peers and oh, ah, horrible. Well, Sarah, Sarah, you do a uh, horn ensemble and Berlin brass ensemble, so you're out there doing a ton of uh, uh, outside playing from the orchestra that kind of achieves the same purpose. That's true. That's why I do the brass ensemble because there are lots of solos in that that you do have to have a you know good chops for it. But I'm still totally impressed with you two at doing this piano and horn thing because that's something that I can I. Uh, Dave uh, Gail wanted to know in the Bach, do you use horn, pitch, bass, clef, or concert? Uh, I use the Wendell Haas version just because I've had I've had that a long time and I think it's it's uh, trained very well for the range of the horn. Um, I, I I don't really believe it's necessary to do it in the original key. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, pitch the pitch center was much different in box time, and um, you know I just think one should find a key or an arrangement that's most flattering to the horn, and I think that's uh, in the Wendell Haas edition for at least for me. That's why I yeah, stick to it. Yeah, me too, yeah. Denise. Yeah. I completely agree. I, I I play out of the Wendell Haas book, and um, I believe it's much more hornist. It just suits us a lot better. It still shows off a fantastic low range, and you can be and beautiful in that range. And uh, it's actually become quite popular to ask for the Bach in its original key for students here. And I, I, I sort of struggle as to why why that's being asked that way. I why not in the Wendell Haas key? I just feel like it shows people off in a such a better light. Yeah. Okay, Denise, what are your favorite low horn exercises? Well, <clears throat> I have one that uh, I do every day that I've based off of just the last three notes until. So, um, but I start up, I start up a fifth, so I start on a horn G. <clears throat> and uh, I do, this is going to be hard to describe, but I, so I do the G, D, and G. I could play, has anyone played on one of these yet? Uh, no, it might. Distort. I don't know what the sound will be like. It might distort horribly. Um, anyway, Especially because right I play it loud. Yeah, I, I practice loud. I played a few low tones for Tim um, 
uh, before we start and he was like mm. yeah. <laughs> thanks Tim <laughs> but it, was late, it is late at night in Sydney and he's all alone with his beer in, the, in his office so uh, well you'd think the beer would make it sound better he probably might uh, think it's great by now <laughs> So anyway, so I do, uh, I'll do a G, a D, and then a G, and hold that out. And then I will, and that's all loud, articulated, sort of held notes. And then I'll do um, a broken arpeggio coming up, all slurred, G, B, G, D, G, 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 and then I'll reverse it. And then, uh, and then I just go down chromatically, absolutely as low as I can go, so that I'm down into the fundamental range. Uh, and I'm just trying to play it as loud as I can. That's my favorite exercise for low. How low can you go? How low can you go? I, I can hit the, on, I've, I can say probably 10 times in my life so far, I'm hoping that that number goes up, I've hit the very lowest note, the low F sharp. Uh, I can on a daily basis get the G right above that, but usually the F sharp is just fused by the which time. F sharp? Which F sharp? <laughs> you mean you mean our F sharp? Gone. You got to play this now. Cause you, you can turn away from the microphone. Simon Simon in the UK is playing, saying, "Please play, Denise. Please play." Hold on, I've got some plumbing issues here. Yes. Is that distorting you guys? Tell us if it's distorting, and we'll shut up. It's, it's not to me. It was very quiet. But of course I've been sitting for however long. But yeah, so that was the A. It was probably just fumes over there. But And then I can get the F sharp below that. But again, only 10 times in my life. So I can get that. Dave, can you get that? No. No. <laughs> it, uh, in terms of like what exercises I do every day, I would just... I'll tell people I'm a shameless copycat. If I hear something that I like, I steal it. Like one yeah. time I heard, uh, uh, I heard Ignacio Garcia doing a great low horn uh, uh, warm-up. And he's a fantastic high horn player, but he works on his low range too. And I heard what he was doing. And he studied with Norbert Hauptmann, and Norbert Hauptmann made him play F horn all the time. Oh, all the time. okay. Yeah. So, all the lines. My point is, if you hear something that other people are doing that seems like it might help you, go ahead, steal it. Yeah, yeah. And um, Denise, would did you would you like to play us yours? It wasn't distorting. I thought it sounded great. Okay, well that was so. I'll just play it at a, a mezzo dynamic because that was pretty yeah. mezzo. Yeah. So yeah, my favorite exercise is. Um, is that distorting? No, no, not just normal low horn distortion. And then I would go on to F sharp and F and E, and I would that that whole thing takes me, you know, five, six, seven minutes. To go I'm going to do that one, Dave. I like that. Should we copy it? <laughs> Definitely. And you sound very warmed up. That's really not fair. Um, uh, someone called uh, Bla Blagoya. Sorry if I've said it wrong. Um, I've seen your name a lot, but I don't. I can't read. Uh, Va Vas Vasilevsky, I do apologize if this wrong, but they want us to play our orchest favorite orchestral solo. Um, mine would be this. I, I took that from, from Jim. That was Berlioz, Symphony Fantastique, end of the slow movement. Um, or <laughs> that's quite a nasty solo, though, isn't it? Um, yeah. Do you have any favorites, Denise? You don't have to play it, don't worry. Favorite solo? Boy. Uh... Or most hated solo. Most hated yeah. solo is also my my least favorite. Uh, the solo that actively displeases me uh, would be uh, Don Juan. That's uh, a real bummer. That one. That that little thing is so twiddly. Yeah, and we almost always take it on tour. Always. It's getting up there, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know why. Dave, any tips for that one? Uh, just make sure you're switching between the F side and the B flat side as much as yeah, possible. You da, da, yeah. Da, da. yeah, 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 it really helps. Gail's just asked if you still use norms exercises, Dave. Yeah, I would say I do. Maybe not every day, but uh, they're they're in the rotation. Yes. What what are they? 
I'm trying to make I, you say something here, but you're not biting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just the uh, harmonic slurs. Uh, you know, up and down the range of the horn, and uh, just just great uh, slurs into the low range. Yeah, it's just I'll a one. Play, I'll make you play your favorite high horn ex exercise if you don't play us your favorite low. No, well, okay. I would rather tell you my my least favorite fourth horn moment is oh, yes, tell me. Elgar Enigma variations, first variation. At the end of it, there's just a little uh, line for the fourth horn, and it seems like I need three different embouchures to play. How notes. does that go again? <laughs> I should know that. I, 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 on a low A, and then yeah. it moves to a B, and then a C sharp, and then you end on a D that could oh, just... Yeah. Ba, da, da, da. Yeah. yeah. And that goes through your breaks? Yeah. Okay. How do you... Do, I find that if I don't practice for a few days, my, my very high notes are okay, my very low notes are okay, but it's the middle range that just... Yeah. And all the break, yeah. the, around the breaks. Now... I don't think it's bad to have movement. I don't think it's bad to have mini breaks. I don't really like this, the, you know, huge break on one note, uh, you know, or just between between two notes. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. I sort of know what I mean. Um, a huge movement between one and then the next note. I think it's better to sort of iron it out a little bit. That's just my opinion. But that's what goes first. So that's what I have to work on the most. Um, every day I make sure I do these middle range exercises. But I, I know exactly the one you mean. Dave, that, that's, that's a really nasty little bitty thing. Do you, uh, Denise and Sarah, find that uh, practicing hand stopping is good for the middle register? This absolutely. Is absolutely. Yeah, I, I love working on stopped horn. Uh, I, yeah. you know, down down into, uh, into the what you would start to call possibly the low register, because if you can get the good air to get that to actually speak solidly, then you're doing something right. Yep. Absolutely, it saves time also when you're practicing because there's more, there's more, um, you know, more. It's harder work to play stop. And you know, in the Farkas warm up, he uh, not in the warm up, it's somewhere a bit later. He has a, a good exercise for for um, for that break area. It sounds very simple, but I do it hand stop. It's probably going to sound hideous here, but it's just like. <laughs> and it goes on like that and lower because when you get to. When you get down to there, um, you have to play. I didn't play it too loud, and I'll distort. But if you practice that really loud, it's going to wobble like heck. But uh, it really does give you a lot of strength playing hand stopped in the middle and low range. Yeah. And then you can play the Tchaik Tchaikovsky. <laughs> <laughs> then that's no problem. <laughs> we do make some rude noises. Um, how would you say so much? <laughs> um, Pierre says low horns are very hard to hear in the audience, in his opinion, too quiet and bassoon-like in most cases. So how would you um, combat that, Denise, if you had a, a, a low horn solo? Well, good question. Uh, I wanted to bring this up when we were talking about hand position. I, I think it's been uh, common practice, or maybe not practice, it's just what's happened, that low horns tend to hide a little bit. And I, and I actually want to, I'm very proud to be a low horn player, and I, and I want people to hear me. And I, uh, so the ear hears the high register a lot easier than it does the low register. So a lot of times if I'm playing octaves with someone, I actually will play a slightly higher dynamic than what they're playing so that it sounds equal out in the audience. And I think the clearer we can make our sound, instead of being muffled, that also helps so that it sounds equal because just by nature it's going to sound more muffled down in that register. So I personally bump up a lot of the dynamics and I try to keep my hand as open as possible so I can be clear. Yeah, I agree. Dave? Uh, I really can't add anything to that. Uh, you, I just try to judge everything on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, how important is your line relative to the horn section, relative to the orchestra, and also what the acoustics are like. Uh, one time we were playing a concert in Tokyo, and uh, because where the horns were sitting, the horns were just covering the whole orchestra. And we, we, we had to play everything, I'd say, between piano and mezzo forte, and people said it was still very loud. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that really is. Miguel has just asked, Miguel Horn, he's asked this question a couple of times, so I, I must ask it. He said, what's the most expected thing that a low horn player has to do to impress a jury? At least I think that's what you meant um, for people who are auditioning. What, well, what would you want to hear from a low horn player in an audition, Dave? Uh, beautiful melodic lines in the, in the low range and 
Uh, a good criteria is, does it sound easy? Yeah. And you, you don't want it to look too difficult, too, either, do you know? There's not so, if it's, basically, if it's sounding good, it's usually looking good, but I get a little bit worried when I see in um a, a bit of movement is fine, but uh, the, this sort of, I don't know, Denise, maybe this is a different, a different aspect, because you do like this. Mm -hmm. Remember yeah. that we, we, compared, we compared fish faces when we had the, yeah, that's the one. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. You look like, what, what were you called him from the Muppet show? Yeah, Beaker from Beaker. the Muppets. Yeah. yeah. Or a good sturgeon, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> uh, see, and I, it, I agree with you that it would be nice to, as you move through your break range, to be nice and smooth and steady and just a nice gradual change. Uh, if I had six months of no orchestra and I could iron that out in my own playing, that would be great. But I have a severe break, you know, severe shift. And I can play a lot of notes on my low and or my high in my break range, but I need to be in one or the other. Mm -hmm. So for me, I find that uh, to play in the low, I have to have my jaw jutted out. I have to have really good contact here, and I have to be in somewhat... Uh, and everybody's a little bit different, but has somewhat of that beaker, sad face action. <laughs> yeah, um, we've got so many questions coming in, and we've, we haven't got too much, lo too much longer, because poor Tim in Melbourne, it's midnight there. I'm going to ask him to come in and say hello in a minute, um, but it's midnight, so we can't go on all night, although it's fabulous. I could talk to you guys for hours, so I'm just going to shoot a few more questions at you that are coming in. Fast and Furious. Um, before a question, um, Dave, Mike Llewellyn is watching and says, thinking of the great times that you two had in Civic Orchestra of Chicago. So that can come in. I'm going to send you copies of the chat afterwards so you can see all the great stuff people are writing out there. Oli in the UK has asked another question. When you're playing low and very loud, how do you keep the notes sound round and not too brassy? Dave? A uh, lot of air support there. And sort of sometimes in the orchestra you can forget how you sound because there's so much noise uh, going on around you. You have to have a memory, kind of like a feel, a, a sensation of where that line is that you shouldn't cross. Yeah. And, uh, and then know where that is and you can just stop right before you get there. Because a certain amount of brassiness in the low range I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you do, but there, there is a very, very fine line between ba 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 and ba ba ba. <laughs> it's a very fine line. How often have we heard that? <laughs> I might have played that a couple of times. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, Denise, a quick question for you. Kendall has asked, and this is a question I wanted to touch on, but we got to keep it short, sadly. But he wanted um, to you to tell us quickly about your audition school. Yes, uh, so I have a, a seminar that I run every summer. It's a week-long seminar with my former colleague, Carl Pittock, who's principal in Detroit. And it's all about uh, how to take orchestral auditions for horn. So we have a high horn list, a low horn list. We do mock auditions at the end. We do master classes all week long. And uh, we also work on concertos and performance anxiety, all of those things. So I'm trying to keep it short. But yeah, it's, it happens usually every July. Uh, this year it's happening in Baltimore at Peabody. So yeah, it's a great um, place. Can people uh, sign up online for it, or how does that work? Yes, yeah, so the camp is called Audition Mode, and the website is auditionmode.com, and there's an application there that you can fill out and send in online. Okay, I think that would be another good uh, chat to have on a hangout sometime with you guys because um, auditions are very different in different countries and um, I was talking to Fergus about this the other day and we agreed that we think that here in Germany anyway, especially for our orchestra because um, there's no screen or anything, it's more like an interview here and in the states behind the screen it gets to be more of a competition for perfection because you can't see what you're getting um, and it's just a sort of preparing maybe for these different things. I don't know, Dave, what's your, how, does you, how do you do it in your orchestra? Well anyone who wants to come and audition can. We don't look at a resume and tell somebody they're not qualified. Uh, oh. But it's not uncommon for a, a player to be dismissed after two or three minutes. Most people get closer to five or seven minutes for the preliminary round, uh, and that's that's the closest we can do to being uh, making it perfectly fair. And it will never be perfectly fair, but we call it equally unfair to everybody. <laughs> 
Okay, three last questions. First one, I will uh, ask uh, both of you quickly. Hazel Dean Davis has asked if any of us have had problems with a stutter or hesitation when starting low notes. Freud has talked about how she dealt with it in the upper register on one of the hangouts. Um, any thought in a hesitation problem in the low register? For example, starting variation eight in Don Quixote. That fits, everything fits today. Don Quixote, because you've got Don Quixote in your studio, Denise, you can answer that one. Okay, so Don, Don Quixote says, uh, <clears throat> yeah, for a hesitation tongue, I like, to, I like to do a lot of air attacks and be sure that the air attack isn't coming out as a pop, that it's just starting naturally. And if you can then get really used to what it's like to take in the air and put it right back out and then just add an articulation to that same air stream so that the air is following the tongue instead of the tongue getting up to the teeth too early and that being in control. So I always like to have the air be in control for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, now someone asked down here, uh, any tips? Yeah, Lisa in Jackson, Mississippi asked if any of us have any tips or tricks for playing the horn stopped in the low register. My special trick is to think of not only stopping the hand here, but also pushing a little bit with your left arm, it's good for your, for your arm muscles, and f having the feeling of literally pushing the horn, squeezing it together, like, like, like not just stopping but going mm, like that. And I find that secures the, especially in the low range, that gives you a, the, just a more compact sound. Dave, any tips on that? Um, I think you have to over-articulate too. Uh, your, your normal art articulations probably won't be enough. So at least for practicing, practice uh, in the low range stop with almost like a sforzando articulation on everything. And then you yeah. can, once you, once you can do that, you can round it out a little bit for okay. whatever application. A quick question for you, um, totally no low, low horn. Luke Zyla asks, how many do you expect to audition for the principal horn in CSO? Uh, we have uh, five days set aside in July for that and probably... Oh. They'll hear uh, 30 people every day, so maybe I'd say 150 or That's 200. Amazing. Because yeah. we have a principal horn audition going uh, coming in June, and we're very strict. We're inviting maybe I don't know, maybe uh, at the most 20 people. Um, so that you are very kind, um, but we we have the auditions between rehearsals or in the morning of a concert or something. So, so wow, you guys looking for anyone, Denise? Uh, no, we're all we're all full in the in the section, but we did just have second trumpet auditions, and uh, we heard eighty five prelims, and then had invited a, a number of people to the semis. So, uh, but I, I believe we had something like three hundred resumes come in. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Wow. Wow. That's that's really impressive. <laughs> It's you know you guys it's a really tough world out there as horn players and we just you just never know what's going to hit you whether low horn's going to come in the like low horn job or a high horn job so if you're studying the, the best advice we can give you is practice it all you know really practice it all and then see where the jobs are and once you get a job then then maybe start to specialize but don't you don't you guys think you really yeah, completely agree. And the, for me, the best principal horns are the ones that have great low registers as well. Well, Dave, you were a principal horn so. Yeah. yeah. Oh gosh, there's so many. It's always the same at the end. Everyone's very polite at the beginning, and then the questions come flooding in. The minute I say we're going to finish soon, we have so many questions. What do you guys think? Maybe we should just come back and do another one um, very soon because I really don't think we can get all of these now. Tim has to get to bed. You guys have got to get to your rehearsals. I have a concert tonight. Um, there's so much, so much stuff. Um, yeah. And James Perry just asked a quick one, quick one. What do you do to get the really stuffy notes between low C and G? I'd say get your hand out of the bell, um, and then they're not stuffy. That would be my quick, uh, quick thing. Um, what are your different approaches to particularly role of the second and fourth horn player? Always adjusting to the higher horns, and can you teach that skill? What do you think, Dave? Uh, you can learn that skill. It's mostly listening, and it has a lot to do with your use of dynamics too. The people at the end of the section will make the section sound better if they're playing just a little less loud than one, two, and three. Except in octaves, I agree with right. Denise. In the octaves, right. I really, if we have a solo octave like in in the Mozart symphonies or or whatever, the bottom octave needs to be a bit more. What do you think, Denise? Can you learn that that skill? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. I think it's it's uh, playing a lot of duets. You know, if you're in school, play duets and switch parts and uh, try to see what those different roles feel like. Yeah, no, absolutely. At this point, you guys, I'm really sorry we haven't got to all the questions, but I am definitely going to do another low horn hangout because I just adore it. Um, yeah, Dave, I can see what you're up to. Denise, um, we might just... Have, it. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, don't give anything away. Let's ask Tim to join us here. Tim, are you still there or are you asleep in Melbourne? Where are you? There you are. Tim, can I, I come? Ah, there you are. Hey, everybody. For those of you who haven't met Tim, this is my absolutely wonderful webmaster who is actually responsible for setting all this up. Tim in Melbourne. Um, I can only see you. Only There you are. There, there, I you, am. Are. Hello. there you are. Hello. Um, what time is it? Midnight? Just gone midnight, yeah. And you're ready to go home. Uh, do you have any anything that helped the evening go down a bit better there? Oh, there's a, a few things. A few things. A few drinks of water. <laughs> yes, of <course>. Oh, great. <laughs> 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 this is what my webmaster does when horn hangouts are going on because actually Tim is a tuba player um, and uh, so but this is a low horn hangout Tim what did you think some interesting stuff going on there I feel like I'm becoming a better tuba player just by listening to this is that... you've got to get your hand out of the bell that's the most important thing <laughs> I think that's been my problem this whole time yeah <laughs> <laughs> so dear horn hangout viewers um, it's I've had some amazing guests on the hangouts and um, I've never had two guests that are so technically up to date that they are able to play around with Google Plus. Tim and I have often tried this out. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, should we switch to the headwear? We just yeah. wanted to show you what sort of fun one can have. Right? One, two, three. <laughs> Tim? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay, all change, please. Hmm. Nice. So, what do you think of that? Before I oh, Tim, you're here. Tim, you don't deserve a halo because you are drinking. <laughs> so, I am going to go underwater, um, like all good horn players should. Uh, Denise, Denise, you had some pretty clever facial hair, didn't you? <laughs> okay, hold on. <laughs> don't take mine. <laughs> Dave! <laughs> that was randomized. <laughs> but the best part is this. Oh. <laughs> I want to try that. Wait. Oh. <laughs> Tim, you're a bit too randomized now. Today. Where's your facial hair? I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> yes. Nice. So, Dear Horn Hangout friends, um, this has actually nothing to do with low horn except the, the biggest motto of this. Oh, let me take off that. Oh, yeah, we need some screenshots. Can you guys take some screenshots of this out there in uh, Horn Hangout land and send them to me on Facebook? Because whose birthday is it? Hang on, I don't, I don't want to. I, I hit randomize and it just went up there. I don't want to be it anymore. There we go. That's good. Well, oh, Tim, you took mine. Okay. Sorry about that. Or maybe the horns. The horns are quite good. Or the kitty cat face without the horns. Ah, now that's good. Oh, so the, cat's the kitty cat face and the eye patch. I like that. <laughs> um, I'm too cool for school right please now. Please take some. Um, anyone want to show their horn? Then we can take a really good screenshot with horns. Oh, I like that that's still there. Oh. <laughs> Denise, you left your hair. Oh, no. What's happening here? We can't, we can't have my hair be... <laughs> okay, are we ready for a screenshot, Tim? Are we ready? <laughs> One, two, three, screenshots. <laughs> and I hope all you guys at home are doing some great screenshots because we don't do this for everyone. And whoever's going to be my next guest on the Google Hangouts is probably shaking in fear that he's going to have to wear a cat hat or a, or a pair of earphones. Um, the other thing we can do with this is give yourself <laughs> a round of applause. Okay, um, day, uh, everyone's taking their heads, headsets off, except for Tim. That's good, Tim. You can keep it there. Um, <laughs> thank you, Denise. Thank you, Dave. Tim, get rid of the facial hair. Thank you. 
<laughs> suited you actually. I've, I've seen you, you have the real stuff sometimes even. Um, Dave and Denise, thank you so much for joining us. Really, you two are such heroes and I love the way that you're turning low horn also into, a, into an art and not just something one does because one can't get the high notes. Um, so thank you very much. Dave, have a lovely day. Thank you, Sarah. You more than anyone have done so much just to uh, bring the community of horn players together. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you for organizing that wonderful video um, for the Global Horn Greetings. It was fantastic. I'm looking forward to the next one already. Denise, thank you as well. It's great what you're doing with all the, um, all the, the, the commissions for Low Horn. And, and your video was quite astonishing for the, horn, for the Global Horn Greeting. Um, I was sorry we couldn't include the whole thing. You can see the whole thing up on YouTube, I think, can't you? Yes. We had to cut you down a bit, but um, the whole thing is up there. It's really very special. So thank you. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Thanks for having me. And Tim, from all everyone in the Horn Hangout world, thank you for everything you're doing for us. Pleasure. And it's super fun. <laughs> now you, you're welcome to go to bed. You actually shaved for this Horn Hangout. I'm impressed. Special That's occasion. The, the hair. <laughs> okay. So I'm adding my horns and I'm saying um, bye to the Horn Hangout world and thanks for watching. And um, I'm going to be in Melbourne very soon. So Tim and I are thinking up some. Um, that's not fair. We want some head to head headwear on for the goodbyes. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> um, we're thinking up some live things we can do. If you have any ideas, let us know. And um, yeah, keep watching and practice your low tones, right, guys? Absolutely. Dave, no hat. Oh, right away. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Have a great day. Bye.